Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for January 18th through 24th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 3 through 5. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Oh, this is so exciting. Can't wait. Now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 13 minutes, 27 seconds. And what if I wanted to read daily? How much time would that take? 1 minute, 55 seconds. So just under two minutes. Well, and we should be reading daily. Yes, we should. Reading daily. You know what's so important, though? It's so easy to see. Look, under two minutes of daily reading, and we could cover the reading assignment. But what's more important, rather than how much we're reading, is the time that we're spending on what we're reading. So the time that we give you here, they're meant to encourage you to say, hey, easy peasy, we can do this. But most important is spend the time in these verses. And we'll be offering some tools today that can help you with that study. We sure will. Now we've got time codes here, if you wanna go section by section. So let's jump into section three. Okay, this is gonna be really neat. So let's take a look at what's happened so far. Remember that on September 22nd, 1827, Joseph received the plates from the angel Moroni. And if you don't remember that, you didn't watch our last episode. So watch that. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, you should do that. And then later in that year, December 1827, Joseph and Emma Smith moved to Harmony, Pennsylvania, where Joseph began translating the Book of Mormon in earnest. And then in February of 1828, Martin took a transcript of some of the characters copied from the gold plates to scholars in New York City. We talked about that last time. And that brings us to summer of 1828, June-July time frame where our story begins today. I'm going to refer to the church history in the Fullness of Times manual from chapter 4. This will summarize what's happening before Doctrine and Covenants section 3 is being revealed. It says, quote, In Pennsylvania, Joseph and Martin labored together in the translation until 14th of June, 1828. By that time, the translation filled 116 fool's cap pages, it's roughly legal size, And Martin asked if he could take this manuscript home to show his wife and friends. And the seminary manual mentions this. It says, Lucy Harris, Martin's wife, became increasingly concerned about Martin's interest and financial involvement in the translation of the plates. She and others began to press Martin for evidence of the plates' existence. Going back to church history in the fullness of times, quote, he hoped this would convince Lucy that the work was legitimate and stop her opposition. Through the Urim and Thummim, Joseph inquired of the Lord. The answer was no. Martin, not satisfied, persisted until Joseph again asked the Lord. Still, the answer was no. Martin's pleadings and solicitations continued. Joseph wanted to satisfy his benefactor. He was young and inexperienced, and he relied upon the age and maturity of Martin. Moreover, Martin was the only one Joseph knew who was willing to work as scribe and finance the publication of the book. These considerations moved him to ask again. Finally, the Lord granted a conditional permission. Martin agreed in writing to show the manuscript to only four or five people, including his wife, his brother, his father, his mother, and Lucy's sister. Martin then left for Palmyra with the only copy of the manuscript. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's just, you know, just reading that is... It just makes you feel tense, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Now, I want to just mention that even sometimes we might get frustrated with Martin Harris's wife, Lucy. To be fair, what she is seeing is her husband expending resources, their resources, on this project that she's not invested in it at all. It's not like, you know, she has her money and he has his money. This is money that affects them both and resources and time that affects them both. And so I do get a little bit why she's so frustrated with this project. And one more thing. When we talk about Joseph being young and inexperienced, let's remember he's 22 at this point. He has had two major visions, but that's as far as we've gone. 
Yeah, there's certainly lots of reasons for her to be suspicious about this project without a spiritual confirmation. So let's go on with the story. Shortly after Martin's departure, Emma Smith bore a son, Alvin, who died the day he was born. Emma nearly died herself, and for two weeks, Joseph was constantly at her bedside. When she improved, his attention returned to the manuscript. By this time, Martin had been gone for three weeks, and they had heard nothing from him. Martin had not been totally irresponsible. He had spent time with his wife, taken care of business in Palmyra, and served on a jury. Emma expressed her concern about the manuscript and encouraged Joseph to catch a stage to Palmyra and check on the matter. After traveling from Harmony to the Palmyra area and walking the last 20 miles during the night, Joseph finally arrived at his parents' home in Manchester. He immediately sent for Martin. Martin usually came quickly, so breakfast was prepared for him and the Smiths. Several hours passed before Martin finally plodded up the walk with head hung down. He climbed onto the fence and sat there with his hat down over his eyes. Finally, he came in and sat down at the breakfast table, but he could not eat. Lucy Mac Smith, the prophet's mother, recorded, quote, He took up his knife and fork as if he were going to use them, but immediately dropped them. Hiram, observing this, said, Martin, why do you not eat? Are you sick? Upon which Mr. Harris pressed his hands upon his temples and cried out in a tone of deep anguish, Oh, I've lost my soul! I have lost my soul! Joseph, who had not expressed his fears till now, sprang from the table, exclaiming, Martin, have you lost that manuscript? Have you broken your oath and brought down condemnation upon my head as well as your own? Yes, it is gone, replied Martin, and I know not where. Self-condemnation and fear beset the prophet. He exclaimed, All is lost! All is lost! What shall I do? I have sinned! It is I who tempted the wrath of God. I should have been satisfied with the first answer which I received from the Lord. For he told me it was not safe to let the writing go out of my possession. He wept and groaned and walked the floor continually. At length, he told Martin to go back and search again. No, said Martin, it is all in vain, for I have ripped open beds and pillows looking for the manuscript, and I know it is not there. Then must I, said Joseph, return with such a tale as this? I dare not do it. And how shall I appear before the Lord? Of what rebuke am I not worthy from the angel of the Most High? The next morning he set out for home. We parted with heavy hearts, for it now appeared that all which we had so fondly anticipated and which had been the source of so much secret gratification had in a moment fled and fled forever. End quote. Exhausted and discouraged, Joseph returned to Harmony. In words written to his mother, he declared, quote, After I left you, I commenced humbling myself in mighty prayer before the Lord, that if possible, I might obtain mercy at his hands and be forgiven of all that I had done which was contrary to his will. From the book Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 6, quote, when Joseph returned to Harmony in the summer of 1828, Moroni appeared to him again and took the plates away. If you are sufficiently humble and penitent, the angel said, you will receive them again on the 22nd of September. End quote. And we get the reassurance from Revelations in Context. They say, quote, The angel appeared and gave again to Joseph the Urim and Thummim, or interpreters, that Joseph had originally received with the plates but had lost for having wearied the Lord in asking that Martin Harris might take the writings. Using the Urim and Thummim, Joseph received the earliest of his revelations for which a text survives. End quote. That is something really fascinating, by the way. That's something that stood out to me this time around. If you look at the Revelation book or the book of Commandments and Revelations, this is at Joseph Smith Papers, you can see that it lists the title of the book, and then the very next line is this revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, Section 3. 
who was received in July 1828, but then was copied from the loose sheet of paper to the Revelation book in March 1831 by John Whitmer. This is the first revelation ever recorded. So as we start into Doctrine and Covenants section three, I want to introduce a study tool that could be very useful during these lessons, especially in sections three and five. This tool let's call name replacement. In other words, use your own name in a verse instead of the person that the verse is addressing. This is not always appropriate, but it's worth a try sometimes to see if it's a message that the Lord wants you personally to have. It helps us to make the scriptural teachings more personal. And I would suggest that this is particularly useful throughout the Doctrine and Covenants. Agreed. Remember everything we just talked about. This is the Lord's answer to Joseph about all the events that have just happened. Let's start with verse 1. The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they come to naught. For God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn to the right hand nor to the left, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Remember, remember that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. This is a remarkable set of scripture. This is a reminder to all of us. The Lord knows everything. He saw this coming. He made accommodations for it. He will always know in advance what's going to happen. And we get this reassurance further from President Joseph Fielding Smith. I found this quote in the Institute Manual. This comes from his book, Church History and Modern Revelation. He says, quote, In his infinite wisdom, our Father has provided for every problem or difficulty that may arise to stop or hinder the progress of his work. No power on earth or in hell can overthrow or defeat that which God has decreed. Every plan of the adversary will fail, for the Lord knows the secret thoughts of men and sees the future with a vision clear and perfect, even as though it were in the past. Jacob, son of Lehi, in his rejoicing declared, Oh, how great the holiness of our God! For he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. He knew that Satan would try to frustrate the coming forth of the Book of Mormon by the stealing and changing of the manuscript, and provided for it hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus Christ, end quote. I love that. It really reminds us, hey, if we really believe that the Lord is omniscient, that he knows everything, he knows everything. Yeah, he does. And that should allow us a great deal of confidence and trust. Mm -hmm. Let's go on in verse four. And as we take a look at verses four, five, and six, Notice that although God said that his work could not be frustrated, he also wanted the prophet to understand the mistakes he had made and the consequences of those mistakes. Now, this is a great place to imagine that you were Joseph. Think for a minute about, as we read, what words or phrases might be hard for you to hear. Starting in verse 4. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, Yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Behold, you have been entrusted with these things, but how strict were your commandments. And remember also the promises which were made to you if you did not transgress them. And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God and have gone on in the persuasions of men. Joseph, you had one job. This is a powerful, powerful rebuke. You know, in a strange way, this to me is a testimony of the reality of Joseph being a prophet of the Lord. Why, you say? This is a rebuke a very stinging rebuke. This is not the only rebuke we're going to see from the (laughs) Lord to Joseph. If this was an invention of Joseph, wouldn't 
Joseph be the hero of the story? Yeah, you'd think so. Wouldn't he be the one that does right in the sight of the Lord, but everyone else does wrong? Yeah. But that's not the case. No, this is far more authentic to our personal experiences. And I'm even looking at verse 6 and thinking of the Lord saying to me, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and gone on in the persuasions of men. So think for a minute about what influences we have prioritized over God's word, God's commandments. It's a great thing for us to reflect on as well. Indeed. So let's look ahead to verses 12 through 14, and let's see if we can tell why Joseph's actions were so serious. Verse 12, And when thou deliveredst up that which God had given thee sight and power to translate, thou deliveredst up that which was sacred, into the hands of a wicked man who has set at naught the counsels of God and has broken the most sacred promises which were made before God and has depended upon his own judgment and boasted in his own wisdom. And this is the reason that thou hast lost thy privileges for a season. Wow. Yeah. How would you like to be the guy who has that attached to him in canonized scripture? Well, and we need to be careful with this. This is a very stinging rebuke to Martin, certainly, being labeled a wicked man. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about that for a minute. There is a quote I found in the Institute Manual. This comes from a book called Introduction to and Commentary on the Doctrine and Covenants. This is from Hiram M. Smith and Jan M. Schodal. They say, quote, Martin Harris was wicked in persisting to ask for what God at first refused to grant. He was wicked in not keeping the sacred pledge to guard the manuscript, but otherwise he was not a wicked man, as that term is generally understood. A father will sometimes call his boy wicked, meaning disobedient for the time being, end quote. You know, despite the fact that this comes from Mr. Rogers, I think it's incredibly true The idea that somebody is all one way or another is just absurd and inauthentic to our life experience. Mr. Rogers says, good people can do bad things sometimes, and bad people can do good things sometimes. So when you hear a phrase like wicked man, understand that that's specific to events, not a claim on the value of a person. Right. There is a good person and a bad person in each and every one of us. And we all have the capacity to choose one or the other. That's part of the whole mortal experience. It is, and I love that we have someone as great as Martin Harris is doing work that I can't even imagine what he sacrificed. And yet, he can also fall into the same patterns we can fall into. And that's a great thing for us to be paying attention to. And I appreciate, well, I appreciate Martin letting the Lord use him as an example here. Well, true. And let's not forget, this rebuke should normally have turned away anyone. I mean, this is a pretty sharp rebuke from the Lord. Yeah, could be very But yet Martin goes on and he does a lot of great things for the church. Yeah. So why was he temporarily wicked? Well, they enumerate these in verse 13. He set at naught the counsels of God. He has broken the most sacred promises which were made before God in protecting the manuscript. He has depended upon his own judgment and boasted in his own wisdom. These are things that I got to believe that all of us have been guilty of at one point or another. Yeah. This is something that we need to take internally. Yep. Let's use that to point it back to us. It's easy to point these features at other people, but maybe a good examination of ourselves would be appropriate. Agreed. Let's go on in verses 7 and 8. And while we do, let's look for what the Lord said Joseph Smith should have done when he was under pressure from Martin Harris. And again, what can we see here that can help us when forces of the world, people that we know, try to influence us against what the Lord wants us to do? Verse 7, for behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men set at naught the counsels of God and despise his words. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm 
and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. And he would have been with you in every time of trouble. Remember when we read before the summary leading up to this revelation, Joseph was nervous. Martin was the guy that was helping him. Martin was the guy who was offering financial support as well. And what happens if he loses Martin? Well, the Lord here says, that is not your concern. You stay close to the Lord first. There's a great quote to emphasize this idea from Elder D. Todd Christofferson in a CES fireside in November 2004 called A Sense of the Sacred. He says, there are many places in the scriptures that counsel mankind to fear God. In our day, we generally interpret the word fear as respect or reverence or love. That is, the fear of God means the love of God or respect for him and his law. That may often be a correct reading, but I wonder if sometimes fear doesn't really mean fear, as when the prophets speak of fearing to offend God by breaking his commandments. We should so love and reverence him that we fear doing anything wrong in his sight, whatever may be the opinions of or pressures from others. And I don't know, John, this makes sense to me when we were growing up because of the respect that I held for the example set by our parents. I never thought about using the word fear, but I didn't want to disappoint them. And I guess yeah. fear in this context could absolutely. So a lot of what influenced my actions wasn't a fear of punishment. It was a fear of falling below the expectations they had in a loving way for me. I wanted to be the son that they saw me to be or strive for it. Yeah, me too. So let's take a look ahead at verse nine. We finally get some reassurance. Look for the promise the Lord gave despite the seriousness of the mistakes. Verse 9, Behold, thou art Joseph, and thou wast chosen to do the work of the Lord, but because of transgression, if thou art not aware, thou wilt fall. But remember, God is merciful. Therefore repent of that which thou hast done, which is contrary to the commandment which I gave you, and thou art still chosen, and art again called to the work. Except thou do this, thou shalt be delivered up and become as other men and have no more gift. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, right away we've got this sense of what is my place in the work? What is Joseph's responsibility and how can he do it? What is Martin's responsibility and how can he do it? And it's a great question for us to be asking, where's our place in the work that the Lord wants us to do and how can we do it? Going on in verse 16, look for the purposes that the Lord gave for the Book of Mormon. Why does he want Joseph to know this? As we go through the purpose, how is that helping Joseph understand his place in the work? Starting in verse 16, Nevertheless, my work shall go forth. For inasmuch as the knowledge of a Savior has come unto the world through the testimony of the Jews... Even so shall the knowledge of a Savior come unto my people. Going on in verse 18. And this testimony shall come to the knowledge of the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites, who dwindled in unbelief because of the iniquity of their fathers, whom the Lord has suffered to destroy their brethren the Nephites because of their iniquities and their abominations. And for this very purpose are these plates preserved, which contain these records that the promises of the Lord might be fulfilled, which he made to his people. How important is that? Is this helping him catch the vision of the importance of this work? That he is helping fulfill promises made anciently to these people to make a savior known to them? How important is that? So let's move on then to section four. Let's give a little context here. We're still kind of in chronological order. We're going to be talking about what happens after Joseph receives this revelation. From Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 6, we read, quote, That fall, 1828, Joseph's parents traveled south to Harmony, 
Nearly two months had passed since Joseph left their home in Manchester, and they had heard nothing from him. They worried the summer's tragedies had devastated him. In a matter of weeks, he had lost his first child, nearly lost his wife, and lost the manuscript pages. They wanted to make sure he and Emma were well. And that quote, is so rough. Good parents. Yeah. From Revelations in Context, we read, quote, During his visit to his son in Harmony, Joseph Smith Sr. asked for a revelation concerning his own role in the Restoration. The young prophet thus received one of his earliest revelations for another individual. When the revelation was later copied in preparation for publication, the following heading was added. A revelation to Joseph, the father of the seer, he desired to know what the Lord had for him to do, and this is what he received as follows. That is such a great question for all of us to ask. What would the Lord like us to do in the work of the restoration? There's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual in which then Elder Joseph Fielding Smith from his book, Church History and Modern Revelation, tells us of how important this revelation was, even though it's really pretty short. He says, quote, It contains sufficient counsel and instruction for a lifetime of study. No one has yet mastered it. It was not intended as a personal revelation to Joseph Smith, but to be of benefit to all who desire to embark in the service of God. It is a revelation to each member of the church, especially to all who hold the priesthood. Perhaps there is no other revelation in all our scripture that embodies greater instruction pertaining to the manner of qualification of members of the church for the service of God and in such condensed form, than this revelation. It is as broad, as high, and as deep as eternity. No elder of the church is qualified to teach in the church or carry the message of salvation to the world until he has absorbed, in part at least, this heaven-sent instruction. End quote. It's quite the endorsement. Yeah, it is, and I think that's one of the reasons why missionaries memorize this so much. Mm-hmm. And it's great. Let's jump into it. If you've been a missionary, you know this. Let's talk about it a bit, starting in verse 1. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. <laughs> that's already awesome. Yep, that's quite an ominous statement at the very beginning. From the Institute Manual, I found a really good quote from Elder John A. Witso. This is from April 1946 General Conference. He says, quote, Unknown, untaught, with no reputation, Joseph Smith should have been forgotten in the small hamlet, almost nameless, in the backwoods of a great state. But he dared to say that the work that he was doing, under God's instruction, was to become a marvel and a wonder in the world. We know, my brethren and sisters, that whether it be friend or enemy who speaks of us, if he is a sober-thinking, honest man, he will declare that whatever in his opinion the foundations of this work may be, we know the foundations. It is a marvelous work and a wonder, none like it in the long history of the world. The truths set loose by the Prophet Joseph Smith have touched every man of faith throughout the whole civilized world and measurably changed their beliefs for good." End quote. Amen to that. Love that. Yeah, what a huge work, and what a privilege to be a part of it. Going on with verse 2. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God. And by the way, I just love that word embark, because you embark on a quest. You embark on a journey. This is the beginning of a lifelong exploration. So embark. Love that. O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. There's a lot to unpack even in this verse. I think it's an easier conversation to relate to how we serve God with our heart, maybe with our might and strength. But mind is an interesting phrase to use there. How do we serve God with our mind? And the time that we have together 
those of you who have followed our show, we don't have time to cover everything like we'd like to, but we can point you in the direction that you might find some resources that will bless you in your studies, and this is one of those. Elder Uchtdorf in October 2009 General Conference said one way that we can love God is by, quote, aligning our thoughts and actions with God's word. This idea of loving God and serving God, I think, tie together quite well. There's at Book of Mormon Central, there's an article called, What Does It Mean to Love God with All Thy Mind? And I think we'll find a great parallel in serving God with all our mind. There's a wonderful collection of scriptures and quotes and ideas to help really develop what that means. So we're just going to tease you with it here, but encourage you, if you're interested in that topic, go check out that article and you'll find a lot of great resources there. In verse three, therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. I love that. The emphasis on the desire. What do we desire? Do we desire to serve God? You're called. Yeah. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from then Elder George Albert Smith. This is from October 1916 General Conference, and he expounds on this verse a little more. He says, quote, "My understanding is that the most important mission that I have in this life is first to keep the commandments of God as they have been taught to me, and next, to teach them to my father's children who do not understand them. It is not necessary for you to be called to go into the mission field in order to proclaim the truth. Begin on the man who lives next door by inspiring confidence in him, by inspiring love in him for you because of your righteousness, and your missionary work has already begun. End quote. Yeah, I know we look at this section related to missionary work, but we maybe need to broaden our minds sometimes as to what that means. What is God's work? Well, probably the easiest definition we have is in Moses 139, when he says, Behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. So, if God's work that we can participate in is bringing about the eternal life of our fellow brothers and sisters, then in what way do we serve him? We know that what we need is desire. And then what? There's so many ways to serve and places for us in this work, including the example that was just given. Just inspire love in people, confidence because of righteous living. In other words, hold our light up. What matters is that we're willing to serve wherever called upon, in big ways and small. Just remember what our objective is. We need to align our will with God's will and his work. Let's go on to verse 4. For behold, the field is white, all ready to harvest. Now that's a phrase that makes sense. And it's interesting that something like this is an expression used for Joseph Smith Sr., because as a farmer, he would appreciate this. And the idea is that the wheat has become so light-colored, the term white can be used to show that it's ready for harvest. But there might be another way we can understand it when we often talk about how we want to search out the pure in heart. And we've already talked a lot last year in the Book of Mormon about how white means pure. And that's an Old Testament concept, too. For behold, the field is pure, ready to harvest. Hearts are pure. Intentions are pure. It might be another way to look at that verse as well. And lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And how interesting that is, that our salvation, the salvation of our souls, is intricately connected with working to save the souls of others. Verse 5, And faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence, 
notice that our efforts to develop these divine attributes will help us qualify to assist the Lord in his work. And why? Well, these are his traits. As you look at these traits, explore these traits, ask what they have to do with God's work to bring eternal life to his children. Let's look at a few. I mean, that top list we often see together, faith, hope, charity, and love. Interesting to note that faith and charity are repeated in verse 6. So he brings those up twice, perhaps. That's something important. I like the notion that traits, let's look at a couple here, virtue. In what way is that quality something that will help us to do God's work and bring about eternal life for his children. Think about how we live, how we act. And what about something like temperance? Temperance is self-control. How is self-control in a difficult situation? Think about one in which you maybe were at work or in your relationship where by exercising temperance or self-control, you became a great example or you eliminated contention in a way that was able to help you bring light to someone. And patience, maybe against someone that treats you poorly or someone that tries your patience. You know, we're asked to not just love the people that are easy to love, but also those that are really hard to love. Do you see what I mean? As we go through these characteristics, think and explore about in what ways do these characteristics, what do they do that as we live them, we will be better able to participate in God's work to bring eternal life to his children. And along that line, there's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual. They mentioned that the list of attributes in Doctrine and Covenants section 4, verse 6, is very similar to a list that Peter gives us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. This quote is from President David O. McKay. This comes from October 1961 General Conference. He says, quote, Peter wrote on one occasion that we might be partakers of the divine nature. He realized what it means to be in touch with the spiritual, to rise above the temporal, the sensual, and partake of the divine spirit of God. That is the purpose of making us more capable of responding to the spirit and subduing the sensual. That is why we like to have every young man and every young woman utilize his or her time intelligently, usefully, to bring the soul in harmony with the Spirit, that we all might be partakers of God's Spirit, partakers of His divine nature. End quote. So then the revelation ends in verse 7 with, Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. What a great revelation. I love Very it. Very powerful. Something I to study it. and restudy. Yeah, and how does it apply to us? Well, let's go on to section five. So have you ever heard about something that you would really like to see with your own eyes? This is the situation in which we find ourselves with Martin Harris. Take a look in verse one here, and let's see what Martin Harris really wanted to see. Behold, I say unto you, that as my servant Martin Harris has desired a witness at my hand, that you, my servant Joseph Smith Jr., have got the plates of which you have testified and borne record that you have received of me. Now, quick aside here. You remember the rebuke that Martin Harris received in Doctrine and Covenants section 3? Oh, yes. He was labeled as a wicked man. But what is he labeled as here? He is labeled as my servant. Yeah. Yeah. What does that tell you about the forgiving nature of God? Yeah, the worst thing we could possibly do is get discouraged in this work. The Lord will keep working with us as long as we desire. As Elder Holland reminds us, imperfect people are all that God has had to work with, with the exception of his divine son. So let's look at the background of this revelation. This summary comes from the seminary manual. It says, quote, In March 1829, Martin planned to travel from his home in New York to visit Joseph and Emma Smith in Harmony, Pennsylvania. However, his wife, Lucy Harris, was upset about the time and money her husband was dedicating to the publication of the Book of Mormon. She was also angry with Joseph Smith for having denied her earlier requests to see the gold plates. She filed a legal complaint against Joseph and gathered a number of people who were willing to testify that he had lied about the existence of the plates. 
In addition to the threat of the lawsuit against Joseph, these people warned Martin that if he did not join them in testifying of Joseph Smith's alleged deception and fraud, Martin would be complicit with Joseph and would join him in prison. At this time, Martin had never seen the gold plates himself, although he had acted as a scribe for Joseph. After traveling to Joseph's home, Martin expressed his desire to receive a further witness of the reality of the gold plates. He may have believed that if he could see the plates himself, he would be prepared to testify in court of their existence and clear his and Joseph Smith's names of fraud. After Joseph listened to Martin's request to see the plates, he inquired of the Lord and received the revelation in Doctrine and Covenants, section 5. All right, so let's take a look at what the Lord tells Martin on this subject. In verses 2 through 4, look at how the Lord told Joseph Smith to answer this request of Martin Harris's. He says in verse 2, I, the Lord, am God, and have given these things unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and have commanded you that you should stand as a witness of these things. Notice in verse 3 that Joseph has no power to show these things. This is God's work. He's in charge of who gets to see and who does not, who will be a witness and who will not. In verse 4, Joseph has been given this gift to translate the plates by God. And he will receive no other gift until this work is completed. Interesting to note, again, what's Joseph's role in this work? Right now, to translate this record is his role. There's a quote from the seminary manual from Joseph Fielding Smith in Church History and Modern Revelation. In volume one, he says, Frequently, when people hear the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, they ask if the plates are in some museum where they may be seen. Some of them, with some scientific training, suggest that if the scholars could see and examine the plates and learn to read them, they would then bear witness to the truth of the Book of Mormon and the veracity of Joseph Smith, and the whole world would then be converted. <laughs> I find this interesting, because what do you think would happen if the plates were here and if scholars were able to make a translation and if the translation was consistent with Joseph Smith's? I think people would still come up with the notion of, well, yeah, but it doesn't prove that these people existed. He's just really smart. He came up with this language. Or it's true, but it doesn't prove that these miracles happened. There's certain witnesses were given to understand spiritual things. And the Lord will make that clear as we go. In the coming verses, 5 through 10, we can see why the Lord told Joseph not to display the plates before the world. So let's look at verse 7. Behold, if they will not believe my words, they would not believe you, my servant Joseph, if it were possible that you should show them all these things which I have committed unto you. And then in verse 9 and 10, Behold, verily I say unto you, I have reserved those things which I have entrusted unto you, my servant Joseph, for a wise purpose in me, and it shall be made known unto future generations. But this generation shall have my word through you. Now, several things there. First of all, why did the Lord tell Joseph Smith not to display the plates before the world? In verse 7, they won't believe him. Yeah. Even if he were to show them everything. Yeah, unless they already believe God's words. Right. Then maybe that would have some benefit. But he said, look, if they're not going to believe my words, then the rest of this isn't going to make any difference. Now, I want to point out something that you may have missed in verse 9. He says, Behold, verily I say unto you, I have reserved those things which I have entrusted unto you, my servant Joseph, for a wise purpose in me, and it shall be made known unto future generations. Wait a minute. What is those things? Are there perhaps revelations that have been revealed to Joseph Smith that we don't have yet? It certainly opens the door for that. Yes, it does. And in verse 10, that ever-powerful statement, but this generation shall have my word through you. Yeah, this is so interesting. This is what I was thinking of as we studied it this time. The world cannot bypass Joseph Smith. You can't say, well, I know Book of Mormon is true because the scholars said it was true, or I've seen the plates or something. 
And you certainly can't say, well, I've received a spiritual witness that the Book of Mormon is true, but Joseph Smith was not a prophet. Right. You cannot believe except through Joseph Smith and his mission. God's Word and the Book of Mormon will come through Joseph Smith, and therefore you have to take the whole package. And that's a fascinating challenge. The Institute Manual has a longer form of the quote that Jay had read earlier from President Joseph Fielding Smith in Church History and Modern Revelation, Volume 1. It says, quote, This revelation declared that this generation shall have the word of the Lord through Joseph Smith. There may be some who think that this is unreasonable, and the Lord should use some miraculous means to convert the world. When they are informed that the angel took the plates back again, they turn away in their skepticism, shaking their heads. But the Lord has said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We have learned that people are not converted by miracles or by examining records. If the Lord had placed the plates where the scholars could examine them, they would have scoffed at them just as much as they do today. People are converted by their hearts being penetrated by the Spirit of the Lord when they humbly hearken to the testimonies of the Lord's servants. The Jews witnessed the miracles of our Lord, but this did not prevent them from crying out against him and having him crucified. End quote. Yeah. So important. I think I had a harder time understanding this when I was younger, but as life has gone on, I'm really comfortable with that notion that there are certain tools that God has given us to gain certain kinds of truths, and you can't skip the process for spiritual truth. You've got to have it spiritually confirmed. And we've talked about the nature of having three methods to divine truth, Mm -hmm. physical senses, intellectual reasoning, and revelation. You can use intellectual reasoning to prove and disprove a lot of different ideas. Using that one method alone will not bring you to a solid truth. Revelation will, however. Yeah, we only have so much capacity. And I don't honestly know, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't think of anyone that was willing to die for truths that they've reasoned out. You know, when you hear about people dying for truth that they know, it's truth that they know with a capital T truth, and they've gained it through the Holy Spirit. Whether they recognize it or not. Yeah. So going on in section five, let's take a look at what's going to happen in verse 11 about additional witnesses. Starting in 11, and in addition to your testimony, the testimony of three of my servants whom I shall call and ordain, unto whom I will show these things, and they shall go forth with my words that are given through you. Yea, they shall know of a surety that these things are true, for from heaven will I declare it unto them. I will give them power that they may behold and view these things as they are, and to none else will I grant this power to receive this same testimony among this generation. In this, the beginning of the rising up and the coming forth of my church out of the wilderness, clear as the moon and fair as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. Now, when it says none else to receive this same testimony, what are we talking about here? Because we certainly know that there were more witnesses of the Book of Mormon than just the three. There was the eight, certainly, and then there were others, such as Mary Whitmer. The notion here is this same testimony. While others saw the plates, none but the three saw it in the manner that they did, where an angel had presented and testified to them of its truthfulness. Yeah, surrounded with heavenly glory. And we studied last year the testimony of the three witnesses, but it is unique. So in verses 15 through 20, we get the instruction that the Lord will send the three to testify. Of course, as we've talked about before, you don't get a a witness just to satisfy your curiosity. With that comes a responsibility. Those who accept that testimony from those witnesses, in verse 16, it says, them will I visit with the manifestation of my spirit, and they shall be born of me, even of water and of the spirit. Now, 
for those who harden their hearts, there's instruction as well. Verse 19, a desolating scourge shall go forth among the inhabitants of the earth. And this scourge will repeat from time to time until the earth is empty, if people do not repent. Again, consequences as well as blessings. Now in verses 21 to 22, this is the Lord's command and promise to Joseph. And this is a particularly interesting one to substitute your own name into. Verse 21, And now I command you, my servant Joseph, to repent and walk more uprightly before me and to yield to the persuasions of men no more and that you be firm in keeping the commandments wherewith I have commanded you. And if you do this, behold, I grant unto you eternal life, even if you should be slain. Oh, that's interesting. That's a powerful promise. And it is interesting. It seems that here in verse 22, and also in Doctrine and Covenants section 6, verse 30, both seem to imply that the Lord knew that Joseph would die as a martyr. And he's reassuring Joseph that even if you do, you will be granted eternal life. Yeah. Now, in verse 23, we have an indication from the Lord that he knows the desires of Martin Harris's heart. Take a look in verses 23 and 24 for that conditional promise. This is a statement such as, if then. If this, then this. That's the idea of a conditional promise. And that's a great thing to look for in the scriptures when you want to find a principle or a doctrine that we can apply to ourselves. In verse 23, And now again, I speak unto you, my servant Joseph, concerning the man that desires the witness. That's Martin Harris. 24. Behold, I say unto him, he exalts himself and does not humble himself sufficiently before me. But if he will bow down, see, there's the if, before me and humble himself in mighty prayer and faith, in the sincerity of his heart, then will I grant unto him a view of the things which he desires to see. So that's Martin's situation, but how can we understand that as a principle for us? Again, we can insert ourselves in there. If we will bow down before the Lord, humble ourselves in mighty prayer and faith and sincerity of heart, then will the Lord grant us a view of those things we desire to see. So let's go on to verses 25 and 26, and let's keep an eye out for what the Lord expects Martin to do if he were to become a witness. Verse 25, And then he shall say unto the people of this generation, Behold, I have seen the things which the Lord hath shown unto Joseph Smith, Jr., and I know of a surety that they are true, for I have seen them, for they have been shown unto me by the power of God and not of man. And I, the Lord, command him, my servant Martin Harris, that he shall say no more unto them concerning these things, except he shall say, I have seen them, and they have been shown unto me by the power of God. And these are the words which he shall say. Very clear instruction. Yeah. And very simple. He doesn't want Martin to expound on it at all. He just wants to have him assure people, I have seen them and I have seen them by the power of God. Yep, and this is to be a testimony. This is going to be one of Martin's roles, is to be a witness. And in the next few verses, 27 to 29, it's laid out fairly clearly. If Martin does not follow these conditions, he will not be a witness. In verses 30 and 31, the Lord commands Joseph to translate a few more pages, but then stop for a season. I always thought that was interesting. I think that'll make more sense as we get into our next lesson and we start talking about the introduction of Oliver Cowdery. Mm -hmm. In verse 32, we get a very ominous warning to both Martin Harris and Joseph Smith. 32, and now because I foresee the lying in wait to destroy thee, yea, I foresee that if my servant Martin Harris humbleth not himself and receive a witness from my hand, that he will fall into transgression. So it's not just because of Martin's desires, I guess. It's not just a matter of, I guess, whether he will be a witness or not. He'll have that opportunity. But if he does not prepare to receive that responsibility, then 
he will fall away. And it seems to imply that not only will Martin Harris fall into transgression, but that he will lie in wait to destroy Joseph and the work. So in Doctrine and Covenants 5, we really have a reorientation for Martin Harris. If Martin's philosophy seemed to be, show me and I'll believe, in essence, what the Lord says, in essence, is believe and I'll show you. Seeing is not believing. The Lord gives Martin conditions in order to receive the witness he desires. Martin received the greater witness he sought after he met the Lord's conditions of humility and faith. You see that idea? We meet the conditions the Lord gives, and then we're blessed with understanding and faith and so forth. That's so different. Again, God's ways are not our ways. First, we come to the Lord, we meet his conditions, and then we receive a witness. That's how the Lord does it. So, as we think about today, the lessons that we've had, this idea of the counsel that's been given, the people who are desiring to find their place in this work, and the Lord revealing answers to them, what impressions came to you during our study? What specific changes do you feel you need to make in order to pray with greater humility, faith, and sincerity, so you are better able to receive answers from the Lord? How might this help you to have the power to better resist temptation, like it says in verse 21? and participate in God's work. What counsel to Joseph, Martin, or Joseph Smith Sr. is the most applicable to you, is what the Lord wants to say to you through the scriptures. Great questions to consider as you study this week. Continue to read your scriptures. Remember, we have a lot of shorter and easier assignments this year. Make sure you take advantage of those. Take some extra time to study maybe read and reread. Take some time to substitute your name in for other names in the Revelations and see if that doesn't strike some powerful personal message to you. Yeah. And we'll talk to you more about it at our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs> <laughs>